Welcome to Clyburn Masterpiece. I'm Buddy Bray. I'm your host for Masterpiece. And we come to you from the Kimball Art Museum in Fort Worth, Texas. In Clyburn Masterpiece, we delve into some of the greatest masterworks ever written for the piano. We hear from some of the piano's most prominent practitioners, including our Clyburn laureates. And we hear from other experts in the field of music and the other arts as well. Today on Clyburn Masterpiece, we'll be talking about a composer for whom mysticism was almost as important as the music itself. In fact, the two became one at times. That's the composer Alexander Scriabin, and we'll be talking about him and particularly his Sonata No. 5 for piano, which was a groundbreaker in many ways. We'll be talking to 2013 bronze medalist Sean Chen about Scriabin, and we'll also hear from one of Sean's teachers, that's Jerome Lowenthal, who is a distinguished professor of piano at the Juilliard School in New York. Here's our conversation with Sean and Jerome Lowenthal. What was so attractive to you about learning this piece? Why did you want to learn it? So the first time I heard this piece, I was in high school. I was probably 13 or 14. I was doing a competition somewhere, I forget. And I didn't do well, so I just went, went to Best Buy and was looking through CDs, you know, kind of getting my mind off of it. And I found the complete Scriabin sonata, I think Ashkenazi performing it. And um, so I listened th through it and, you know, number four and number five really stood out to me. They're kind of uh, borderline, you know, they're still very tonal, very harmonically interesting, but not as crazy as when we get to the seventh or eighth. Coupled that with, you know, you read online, program notes, people go, oh, this is one of the hardest pieces ever written for the piano. And, you know, when you're a teenager and you're, you're precocious, you're like, oh, I want to learn one of the hardest pieces written for the piano. So, um, so that was then I, you know, went back to it many times throughout my career. One thing about the music that we're talking about is that it is just at the edge of what attaches it to tradition and what simply frees it into a world of, uh, of fantasy. Um, that's that's a, really a, a technical musical matter. Um, his, har his harmonies, you know. There are harmonies that are very agreeable and they they need a resolution that's what that's what they need and they don't get it it's not just Scriabin whose music is uh, like this generally the the music of the end of the the 19th century um, has this this character of promise and not fulfillment, but que a question of in, in the promise. And he did have a very singular way with harmony, particularly for somebody in his time and place. Can you demonstrate a little bit about what you mean about those harmonies that you were so attracted to? So uh, if we start with, you know, let's go back to the kind of common practice. We have these, you know, major chords, right? Okay, that's very normal. We have dominant chords, which goes to, you know, we go five, one, to dominant. You hear that in rock and roll, right? But we can add another third on top. And then we can add another third. We call it, we stack thirds on top. And uh, Scriabin in his first first symphony actually it end it sorry it begins kind of like that it, as a dominant thirteenth chord I guess and it's just really it, it it's like a floating feeling for me because you have a ground there a fifth which gives you you know okay we're in I'm playing an E in the bass so we're no we know we're an E but we have 
this kind of suspension over it. So it, you can feel the distance between the sky and the, the, the ground for me. And so he, he takes that and he runs with it. That was a little bit technical, but I think it's good. You know, music is so cool because you can think of it different ways, scientifically, mathematically, theoretically, or just even, you know, kind of feeling it in your hands. It feels good to play just like. Right. Uh, and so. then Scriabin could think of it in an even different way, which was uh, his whole his whole desire to transcend the earthly realm, basically, uh, right. to think right. of things in terms of spirituality and, and mysticism. And this is around the time in his life when he uh, when he got interested in th theosophy and um, and sort of this this influenced his compositions a lot in that he developed a very sort of hedonistic uh, life view of life um, that that he got from theosophy and from and from Nietzsche. He was a, a a highly literate person who was deeply steeped in the uh, fashionable uh, cult of Madame Lavatsky and uh, ideas of transcendental uh, uh, imagination. And um, he, th th these ideas appealed to him very much and he wanted to find musical representations of them and he did. Do you think that some of that is responsible for his sort of break with uh, traditional ways of doing things, traditional ways of writing uh, because he and he and Rachmaninoff, for, uh, for instance, were, were born a year apart in the same part of the world. Uh, they, they had similar schooling, but they could not have developed more differently. Scriabin was, was born to be a theosophist, as you might say. It corresponded very much to his unique temperament, to his unique genius. And of course, he was uh, educated in the same way as all of the other people in his generation. Taneyev was his teacher. Taneyev, who, who had been Tchaikovsky's student and who was a great musician. And Taneyev loved Scriabin, but he thought that his music was insane. Was there something, do you think, in his personality and his psyche that did not feel limited? Uh, by traditional ways of, of concert performance, traditional ways of writing? Yes, I think this is a whole psychic question. He wasn't grounded. In his life, he wasn't grounded. In his music, he wasn't grounded. The music always, always goes somewhere else. And of course, that's not so true of the early music, but you can feel the direction in which his his music is, is going. If you if you compare the opus uh, the opus two, you know. <laughs> that etude. And then the ninth sonata. There's no longer anything underneath. There's only possibility, uh, uh, air, mystery, clouds. I, I was thinking this morning about works like that very etude, that first little etude, which has that sort of Russian melancholy vibe to it, but also is very grounded in the key of C sharp minor. And uh, a work like the third sonata, which which does go on a few flights of fancy, but is nevertheless grounded on F sharp, very yeah. grounded there. Um, but somewhere there was a break from, from that groundedness. Griabin's fifth sonata was kind of a turning point for him, his, his style. He started to uh, really, it, it really starts to sound like what we think of as Scriabin's mature style. What do you think he was trying for in the fifth sonata? What, where do you, what, what was he striving to do? What, what atmosphere was he trying to create both for the performer and for the listener? 
So the famous story about this sonata, he wrote it in a flurry. He had his idea of it. I think he wrote it in like a weekend or a week or something insanely fast, maybe even faster than that. He wrote a quite long poem, a very sexually graphic poem to go with it, um, which I encourage you to read on your own time. And in a way, it's kind of a mystic creation story, you know, from nothing. And then there's all this light and life and all this kind of stuff. And um, I think this piece sort of embodies that explosion. This opening is so weird and strange and there's no other piece like it. I think it is about this kind of burst forth from, no forth from nothingness and just a lot of life and exuberance and kind of, you know, a flash of light and then kind of disappearing quickly at the end. Can you, can you show us how the piece opens because you're right, it is very singular in the piano repertoire. Nothing else quite starts like that. But it does get the audience's attention of course, because it, it does sound like a rumbling or an explosion and it, it, and it does sort of explode across the, the length and width of the keyboard. Uh, can we talk about what comes next? Um, what I'm getting to here is that we have certain expectations of what the word sonata means. There are a couple of hundred years by now or even more than that accrued of, of of connotations about what a sonata actually is. We have expectations about a sonata. And one of those expectations for many of us is that there will be some sort of intelligible structure. If we were to take a more broad picture uh, approach of what first theme and secondary theme and uh, you know what key relationships those entail, then actually Scriabin might be one of the most literal sonata form composers ever. And uh, it's very interesting because it doesn't sound that way. The music, while it's full of clouds and mystery, it's also very square in its composition. He writes almost always in little boxes of, of four measure phrases. He may have done it consciously as a, I mean, uh, you know, uh, with, with, with the plan in order that his music, which is um, otherwise so difficult to understand, can be understood. Mm -hmm. For me, the, uh, the, the, the performer's question is, how much do you want to emphasize the, the squareness of the music? If you, if you don't, the perception of the listener is all flight, is all, is all imagination, but maybe that's fine. Our first theme is this kind of, it's, it's titled Languido um, and So it's kind of this, we have this oscillating and then this little and and that's sort of the theme. You know, I, when you're listening to it, you're like, okay, we have this, we have this mood, we have this floating mood. And I think what, when, when we're looking at the sonata form in this period, then we have to treat that, yes, that's a theme. That is a, a very important building block. Right. Uh, what comes after that? So what comes after that is uh, one of like one of my favorite parts, one of the favorite parts of a lot of people, but also one of the most difficult parts to play. Um, and but I, I wouldn't say this is a theme. I think this is a transition theme between the first and the second theme. So this is you know uh, we'll see how many notes I hit right. But... Scriabin, again, not being like any other 
composer. He was going for a different sort of atmosphere there. It needs to sound, it's very fast. It also needs to sound a little skittish yes. uh, in a way. It's got to be soft and fast. We're not used to soft and fast and jumping right. around, but there's, there's all that that he requires. Uh, what comes after that? There's this ending part of the Maybe. transition, I guess. Yeah, yeah, right. But but before that, we have uh, this. And Scriven loves this kind of, I, I would say, horn or trumpet-like kind of very declamatory. Um, and then is a foreshadowing of what you just played of this like, yeah over this so he kind of uses that cycles through that but it's it's such a slow motion that it really just feels again like the first theme kind of just floating and without much direction it seems you know and i think maybe that's what's what's interesting about this piece is all the the sections with direction are not what we typically consider as the weighty, meaty sections of a sonata form. So the first and second themes are just kind of this hovering, amorphous, really content in where it is. Whereas the transitions, they are, you know, usually more um, agitated. They take you from one to another, but they're the ones actually that we remember more of this sonata, the transition sections, the development, the retransition, the, all those sections of the coda, all those sections are the ones that we gravitate towards, it seems. He was doing his own thing. He was not constructing a sonata in the same way. He was not constructing a narrative or an mm -hmm. arc in the same way right. uh, that, that, that composers, even Chopin, had, had done before him. So, so that, you know, we can take a sonata form, we can take those three building blocks as kind of one big, you know, uh, aggregate block. Um, so we, we, we can say whether this is true or not later, but in a sonata form, that first aggregate building block comes back later as the third aggregate building block, usually well, obviously with some changes so that, um, so that makes sense. But that's generally what happens. Fine. So let's leave that. Let the second building block is what we call the development, which is sort of, it didn't used to be, not in Mozart's time, not so much, but now we've kind of taken as really where the composer gets to showcase their chops. Uh, usually with developments, you can tell when it happens because it'll it'll begin kind of similar to the first part of the piece. So in this case, it does. He goes. So that comes back in a different key. They can take really anything that's come before. And shorter, longer, louder, softer. There are all kinds of permutations that you could put even the even the littlest bit of, of music through in a development. Is that true here in this sonata as well? Yes, definitely. You, you, you have, you know, the this kind of imperioso theme comes back. You have that. Uh, you have obviously the first theme. It starts off kind of like the opening of the piece does but he kind of interrupts that, right, pretty quickly with... So we have these chords come back, juxtaposed on top of... So uh, that's one of the other kind of things development sections often have is not only do you bring the themes back, you kind of mash them up like a medley, you know, you put them on top of each other and uh, you know, it showcases the composer's genius in making these themes work harmonically. How does he get back home? How do we get back home? So I think this is one of the coolest things. You can often come back to the second theme first, 
You don't even need the first theme. You can bypass the second theme. Mozart often does this in rondos. Well, I'll just point it out. One of my favorite parts in the development is he has this leggerissimo volando. Volando is a word that Scraban likes, flying. Um, and it's sort of a compressed, like super speed version of the opening. So you got, uh, I'll play a little before if I can. <laughs> Um, so you have this in the top, and if I could demonstrate, that's, and also this is, right, so, so he kind of compresses it, and it's kind of this ecstatic, like, super crazy and manic version. You used the word, um, ecstatic. Uh, I want to drill down on that just a little bit because it's such a big part of his aesthetic. Mm -hmm. Exaltation, mm -hmm. ecstasy. What does that mean in the world of Scriabin, do you think? I think there's a sense of losing control. And I think uh, a, a good performance of this piece isn't the most no perfect one, but it's the one that isn't afraid to let loose at those specific spots. You know, you just got to go for it. And there's this kind of like unleashed, like unrestrained energy. You know, you won't find any resolution that that gives you that sense of satisfaction in a ha ah, kind of way. It's just like, you know, kind of flying everywhere, like, you know, throwing off all the, the reins. And now from the preliminary round of the 2013 edition of the Van Cliburn International Piano Competition, here is third prize winner, Sean Chen playing the Sonata Number no. Five for piano by Alexander Scriabin.
live performance from the 2013 edition of the Van Cliburn International Piano Competition. That was a performance by bronze medalist Sean Chen of a work by Scriabin, his Sonata Number no. 5. Thanks so much to Sean Chen for playing for us, for talking to us, and also to Jerome Lowenthal for providing his valuable insights about Scriabin and his world. I'm Buddy Bray. Thanks so much for watching Clyburn Masterpiece.